Um, our next speaker began his quest for better fuel efficiency with his brother Don, modifying fuel systems in a 1984 Ford Tempo, taking it from 18.6 miles per gallon to an amazing 108, with huge gains in performance. In March of 2009, he discovered the modification for intake air systems, now known as the Gadget Man Brew. It is proven to increase mileage substantially, boost power at the same time. Using a multi-gas analyzer, the Gadget Man Groove, which is currently patent pending, has shown a reduction in hydrocarbon emissions of up to 70% and sometimes more. Let's welcome Ron Hatton. No stranger to the microphone, I've been on stage a lot. Uh, first of all, thank y'all, everyone. Um, if I get teary-eyed, uh, I remember where I come from. Um, three years ago, um, I was nothing more than a garage level tinker, working on my ex-girlfriend's Land Rover, okay? I've always had a passion for fuel efficiency. I, walk, I remember when I was selling, I'll make it this big, uh, walking by uh, our regular station wagon, my dad was working on it. He was always working on it. God bless, we thought he was a mechanic. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, so I walked by it and this stitch was coming out of the tailpipe. And uh, we all know what that is. That's, that's your fuel, right? We do know now. Two things go into your engine, air and fuel. If you can smell it coming out the tailpipe, it's not the air. It has to be the fuel. Right, so anyway, but I said, Dad, what is that smell? He said, oh, yeah, the carburetor's running a little rich. That's fuel that you smell. And at that point, I realized there was something not quite right because we're putting stuff in the, t in the tank that goes through the engine and then comes out the tailpipe without really giving us any benefit. Right? So I worked on things, and I've, I've seen some pretty amazing stuff in my, in my adventures, just as many of you have. How many of you guys are, are actually developers, actually working on something you have an idea. If it's only on paper, it counts as being a developer. How many of you are there? And that's about about 90% of the group here. Right? I guess the rest of you guys are just curious, right? Okay, well, hopefully you're gonna get a lot of your curiosity satisfied this week. Now, uh, Mike Harada, I'm gonna talk to you. All right, I, this man right here, you, you heard what he's doing. He's doing exactly what we all need to be doing. Just taking whatever resources we have and then sharing it with people in the best way that we know how to help you accomplish your goals, okay? Well, since that time when I burnt my nose on my dad's exhaust pipe, all right? Now, there's a few people here that were with me yesterday when I did some modifications. Uh, would you guys raise your hands? I can't quite see you. All right, how many of you guys actually smelled the exhaust coming out of the vehicles? One, two, three. All right, would you guys just stand up for me so I can see you easier? All right. All right, let's, let's start with you. All right, tell me what you smell coming out of the tailpipe of that truck. Uh, What'd you smell? Uh-huh. Oh, like okay, thank you. What'd you uh, smell? Smelled like warm air. I, you know, it's the best I can smell. You mean you didn't smell any fumes? Well, my sniffer doesn't work the greatest. But <laughs> I, you know, I don't want to exaggerate, but I don't, I don't think they did. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, hardly, hardly any fumes out of the truck. Thank you. Now, very little fumes, if any, a lot of hot air. A lot of hot air, which is what you're going to find on stage today, too. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, see, what, what has happened in the automotive industry is through what I believe to be surreptitious means with alternative ends, uh, they have designed many things into the engine to force it to consume more fuel, okay? Now, this is a very common idea, but how have they done it? Well, I'm gonna give you guys a couple of things today that you can take home and use on your cars right now. Number one, there's, there's two things to consider when you're considering vaporization of your fuel. Vaporization has to occur before combustion can take place, okay? Does that make sense? You cannot burn a liquid because it has to mix with the oxygen before it can burn, make sense, okay? So, but there's two factors. There's temperature, or BTU content, and pressure, right? The standard law of temperature and pressure applies. What's the boiling point of water? Somebody speak out. 
212. Right, 212 degrees, right? At sea level. That's the whole equation, but most people forget the second half. They say 212 degrees. Most people don't even know what the boiling point of water is, truth be told. I've asked hundreds and hundreds of them. Most of them say, uh, I forget. Okay. Exactly. What, would you repeat that, please? Stand up, stand up, let everybody hear you. You can boil water by drawing a vacuum on it. It's like you raise the pressure in your, uh, in your pressure cooker. I put a little wobbler on the top and I raise the pressure and your temperature is going to go up. And it stays in the liquid state under pressure, right? Yeah. Here, we're, what, what's our altitude here? About 1,000 feet, maybe? 2,300. 2,300, okay. So water doesn't boil at 212 degrees here. It boils at somewhere around 209, maybe 208. Denver, it boils at 203. Why does it take less heat to boil it? Because there's less atmospheric pressure pushing on it. Now, this is a standard thing that is taught in the 6th, 7th, 8th grades now, all right? And these automotive engineers that go to school for 8, 10, 12 years are pretending like they don't know it. Because how many vacuum lines do you see on your intake manifolds nowadays? Okay? It's, it's a nightmare, right? Okay, but everything that you attach to the intake manifold, which is where the vacuum is created in the engine, creates a load on that vacuum. So when the piston starts pulling down, the hose is collapsed infinitesimally, but it's enough to soften the vacuum that could be presented to your fuel. Now, what the gauge main groove does is it amplifies a natural occurring process inside the engine. The way the engine works right now, it helps it do what it's already doing, which is what we should be doing is working in harmony with our engines, right? PCV valve. This is a pollution control device, right? No, it's a pollution creation device because it drains off a substantial portion of the vacuum in your engine. So the first thing I want you guys to do is go and take, check this out for yourself. Pull off the vacuum line on the intake manifold to your PCV valve. Put a vacuum cap in its place and drive your car, right? You'll notice that your power will go up you'll notice that your emissions will go down. And you'll also notice that you'll get probably one, maybe as much as three or four extra miles per gallon out of your car just by capping off the PCV valve. How come you guys ain't writing this down? Huh? Okay? Write it down. PCV valve. Positive crankcase ventilation. That means they're using a force to create a vent. Well, it doesn't need a force. It just needs a vent. The crankcase ventilation system is a system. It's the supply air comes from before the throttle body, between the throttle body and the air filter, runs into the one side of the engine, goes down through the crankcase, picks up the fumes, and then goes back up into the PCV valve. When you disconnect the PCV valve, it's still going to vent, it's just going to vent in a different location, and it's not going to steal your engine vacuum. Okay? We all on the same page with that? Yeah. All right. There's another area where they steal from us, and we just accept it, okay? your spark plugs. Now this is not true on every engine, but about 90% of them that I've worked on, this works, okay? Your coil has a maximum rate of say, we'll, we'll call it 100,000 volts just to make it easy to, to figure. Your spark, but it, there, there's a decay in the, all electronic systems over time, right? So if they manufacture a car, the coil's rated at 100,000 volts and they know that they want it to last say five years, well, over a five-year period, that coil may decay to, say, 80,000 volts or even more, right? So what do they do? They set the spark plug at, say, 40,000 volts. But the coils charge on a ramp. And what happens is as soon as it hits enough charge inside that system, it discharges based on the gap of the spark plug. Got that? Okay. A wider gap requires more voltage. A narrow gap requires less. Try this. If you've got a single coil system, it doesn't matter. If, you, if it's a single coil system, then it's easier to do. Pull one, pull one, start the engine, pull one plug wire. Listen to the change in the engine. Shut the engine off, pull the spark plug, increase the gap by 20% of factory. Okay? Reinstall the spark plug. Listen to the engine. Pull the plug wire. Notice how much it changes. What you want to do is you want to hear a lot of change until all of a sudden it doesn't change anymore. Then you've hit the maximum value. So you continue to increase the gap on your spark plug by 20% until that spark plug begins to misfire. Okay? Then you know that you've hit the maximum value. Go back to the previous setting 
and apply that value to all of your spark plugs. By doing this alone, with nothing else to an engine, I've given as much as five miles to the gallon on a car. Five miles to the gallon just by recapping your spark plugs? The engineers don't know this? You know? You know, I didn't even graduate high school, and these guys have been to college for eight years? They don't know their basic science? Come on. Somebody's not telling the truth. Can you repeat that process, the procedure? Sure. Real, real simple. Increase the gap by 20% over stock. What you're trying to do is find out what the max value of your coil is. You don't know. It doesn't really matter what the max value is. Don't get too into the details because it'll kill you. <laughs> All right? Just get to the maximum that, that that coil will put out. So you just keep increasing the gap on that spark plug until that spark plug no longer fires. How do you know if the spark plug is firing or not? You listen to the engine. Use your ears. Okay? You can tell by the way the engine's running when it starts missing. Okay? If when you pull the plug wire, the engine doesn't change, then that plug is missing. You see? Okay? So you pull that, you put it back down to the next set. And then you apply that value to all your spark plugs. You guys got that? Did you say why it does that? Yeah, because they, they, why, I, I, I don't know. I mean, why does it what? Why does it increase the efficiency? Why does it increase the efficiency? Because with the wider gap, it, it, it allows the coil to charge it to a higher level, which is more voltage. More voltage is more energy. More energy delivered to the spark, delivered to the fuel inside the combustion chamber, equals better combustion. Is that something? How do you know if you've got a single coil? Count them. Huh? Count them. You know, look, just look at it. Some, some have coils right there on top of the spark plugs. Now, those you have to do individually. Okay? And it's a bit of a process, but once you have that maximum value for your system, if you ever go back to change your spark plugs, which you usually don't need to, right? Then you've got the value. Just write it down. And whenever you sell the car, you might not want to. <laughs> you know, might decide to keep it forever. Then tell the next owner. This is, take note of this. This will save you some money. Do this on the rest of your cars. You'll be happy. Right? There's a few out there, I don't remember what the specifics are, that don't respond to that. They've already maxed them out in the interest of better efficiency. But the vast majority of vehicles out there on the road are poorly, poorly adjusted. And we're using factory settings. I've done so many tune-ups where after doing full tune-up, new plug wires, plugs, cap, rotor, all that, the mileage goes down. Why? Because of a little thing called gap creep. Now you, you say, yes, this happened to you, right? There's probably a bunch of us out here. Have said, oh my, it's time for me to do a tune-up. I want my mileage to go up. And it goes down instead. Right? Why is that? Because if you ever bother to check your spark plug when you pull it out, there's a thing called gap creep. Every time that spark plug fires, it burns a little bit of the metal off. So your gap is supposed to be like this, keeps getting wider and wider and wider. As it gets wider, the coil must deliver more voltage to jump that gap. It also retards the timing a little bit, so it's firing later in the cycle closer to top dead center. Most of the cars out there on the road today are running at 30 degrees before top dead center. The piston hasn't even come up to the top and they're already fired. Why? Because the fuel is crap. Right? Somebody told me, and I, I can't repeat the guy's name. I get, I get interesting phone calls. I have some really interesting friends. <laughs> okay? And, and you guys will too. You guys, if you don't already, you probably do have. Uh, called me up and said, Ron, listen, uh, I got some news for you. Said, uh, you know, uh, my company, ABC company, we'll call it, uh, just received a shipment of uh, chemicals, all right? Hazardous waste. Said they put it into the refinery. Into the refinery. Think about that for just a minute. The garbage that the manufacturing companies can't get rid of, we are now paying the oil companies to put into our gas tank. Okay? Now this is just rumor has it, but doesn't it make sense? You know, it makes, if you're a business corporate man, you say, well, I can't pay to get rid of this stuff. Ooh, you know what? I'll sell it to the oil companies. We'll make a profit, and the people will never know what hit them. Not until it's way too late. Cancer, asthma, the list goes on. Right? And we, the people, suffer because of that. Okay? 
Now, while I know that the Gedge Mangrove is only a small piece of the puzzle of, of true freedom, true power for the people, it's what I can do. Okay. So I've kept the price down as low as I possibly can. You know, guys, it's spread around the world. It's now in more than 20 countries. 20 countries, okay? I've got an organization in Russia that's growing. Here, here's a little tidbit for you. Russian vehicles that receive the Gage Main Group respond in a certain way. Not a single Russian vehicle that's received the Gage Main Group has gotten less than 50% increase in mileage. Not less than 50%. Now, you know, I've been dealing with this for three years, and 50% is not impressive to me. Okay? It is to you guys, but you, you're just now hearing about this, right? Okay? If you get less than 20% increase in mileage after having the group applied to your vehicle, I apologize. Okay? Every modification has had a 100% money back guarantee. Why would I do that? Once I have your money, shouldn't I be happy? Well, but if you're not, I'm not. Okay? Do, do some searching. You'll find that there are people out there that tried the groove that somebody else put on that I didn't teach how to do it. All right? There's one guy, Prescott McCurry, lives up in Maine. Look him up. All right? Called me up one day, said, uh, I got that PD catch man group. Let me tell you my car runs like that. And he was screaming at me. I said, Well, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I don't remember your name. Did you know? Did, am I forgetting you? He said, He said, No, no, no. You didn't do that, bro. The so and so did. I said, Wait, would you repeat his name? Now I know everybody in my network. First name, last name, where they live. Usually their spouse's name, the children too. All right. That's something about me. I remember people for years. They're surprised. And I said, well, I don't know him. I did not teach him how to do that. So whatever he did, your throttle body was not the gadget man group. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. I'll fix it for you. He said, what? I said, yeah, I'll fix it for you. I didn't get paid from it. I usually don't. But I'm, you thought you were buying the gadget man group. You didn't get the gadget man group. You send me your throttle body. I'll fix it. I'll send it to you at no charge. He said, well, OK. Why not? Sure, why not, right? So he sends me his throttle body, I take one look at it, and it was just a disaster. I reach over, I'm in my shop, so I just reach over like this and chuck it. And turn right over to the computer and start doing a search for a throttle body for me. Call him up, same time, I'll get the throttle body at $42, no problem. Hey Prescott, listen, I got some bad news, I had to throw your throttle body away. Get me fixed. Just, just, just too far gone, you know? I said, but good news is I'm going to order you new, and I just wanted to call you and let you know it's going to take a couple of weeks before I can get it to you. Maybe 10 days. What? You do that for me? I said, yeah. He said, you don't even know me. I said, I don't know you. I am you. Just like so many other people on this planet that have bought what something they thought they were buying actually turned out to be something else. Well, this man bought the Gadget Man group. I may not, you know, it doesn't cost me much to do the group, right? So I'm in a position where I've got a few dollars. I can afford to buy them with Rollo Body, and I can afford to make it right. So I did. He said, Ron, he said, you'd really do that, wouldn't you? I said, yeah, I, said, yeah, I would, Prescott. I sure would. Matter of fact, I'm getting ready to hit the buy now, but he said, don't. He said, I've got a spare throttle body. You see? Now, that's cool, right? So he sends me the spare throttle body. I modify it. I send it back. He gets 68% in place in his Jeep. Now he sent me five more throttle bodies without asking for a discount. I really love those customers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And he is one of the most outspoken proponents of my business. Why? Because I did the best I could for him. Okay? That's what each and every one of you should be intending to do for everybody. All right? The more we do that, the stronger we become as an organization. Because it's not, I didn't bring me here. You guys brought me here. Whether you knew me before or not, it's your efforts to make this planet a better place that has brought me to where I am today. Everybody in my network, I'm just, I'm just a country boy. You know, I'm not a rocket scientist. I don't have a PhD. I didn't graduate in high school, right? I'm just a tinkerer with a dream that God smiled on one day and gave me a flash of inspiration. That first car I did was a 2000 Land Rover Discovery. You get about 200 miles a tank. Go to the airport, I'm talking to a pilot who holds the world record for efficiency in flight. Broke his own record like six times, right? And he's describing the turbulence over his wings. I go, I said, can I take a look at your, at your craft? He says, sure, Ron. So I walk up to his craft, and you think about efficiency in flight, you think of it slicing through the air, right? You want least resistance possible, right? Yeah. 
Everybody agree with that, right? Uh-uh. Now, I look at his main tip, and there in front of his ailerons, he's got these little plastic things sticking up. We've seen them, right? Vortex generators, right? And I say, I knew what they were, but I couldn't figure out what they were to him, right? So I looked at him, and I said, there's a string that must have been 30 of them on each way. And I said, I said, what are those? He said, those are called vortex generators. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know that. But I could never quite put it in my head, could never quite grasp what was happening at the air. I said, I know that, Gary. I said, but what the hell do they do? <laughs> you know? And, and that's when it hit me. He said, Ron, what those things do is they grab the air and force it to roll down over my aileron so I have more control of my craft in flight. Bing, 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 bing. I don't know where it came from. I've never studied aerodynamics until after the group. Never before in my life have I ever studied trying this, ever. And I go, wow, if I could do that inside an engine, something great would happen. And there's this energy that comes with a good idea, right? You know, you can't put the idea down, and I couldn't. And then instantly, the shape was in my head as to what I had to do. I never studied aerodynamics. Where did the idea come from? It didn't come from me. All right, I'll give God credit for it. So, I'm like, man, and this, this idea will not leave. I cannot get it out of my head. And as soon as I get home, I, I can't wait. I, I don't even go in the house. I pop the hood on the Land Rover. I pull the throttle body off. And, and, and guys, I'm broke. I don't even have five bucks to my name. And I look at this, and I, 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 I use a dead man's grimace. Folding table, gravel driveway, 110 degrees, right? Phoenix is not a cool city, all right? Some people think it is, not me. Uh, and, and that's where this came from. When I cut the groove into the first throttle body, it was nowhere near as good as it is today. The first thing that happened when I stepped on the gas pedal is the tires broke loose. You guys know Land Rovers, they're dogs. They may climb a tree, but they're not going to do it fast, okay? <laughs> the tires broke loose. I'm like, oh, 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 something happened here. And I started getting worried because it, something worked. <laughs> oh my God, is it going to break? You know, this has happened to all of us. We do something that really responds well at first, but then Disaster strikes? <laughs> oh, oh my God, but I can't afford to lose an engine on a land rover. It's like 10 grand, right? So, I said, okay, well, you know, I'm not gonna mess with it. It seems like the engine's running smooth, it's looking good, it's sounding good, it's got more power. And we take it out, right? My, my girlfriend's out running around in town the following Friday, and she pulls up to a red light, and she's got a key. Me or Miss Nate, but she's keen, right? <laughs> And so, so she pulls up to a red light, and this dude in the Corvette pulls up next to her. Right? And she'll tell the story today. Right? He looks up at her and goes, vroom, 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 vroom. Right? Okay, it's working with him. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she looks back at him, huh. vroom, vroom, back at you, sir. Right? When the light changes, they both punch it. Okay? To this day, she swears that that Land Rover was in front of the Corvette for 400 yards. 7,000 pounds being pushed by a 4.0 liter V8. You guys know your physics, right? 7,000 pounds plus the brush popper and the running boards and the driver. You look at 7,500, maybe 8,000 pounds by the time you get done with everything she had on that car, including her. Uh, out running a 2,000 pound car with an LS3 5.7 engine. That's impossible. The Corvette is designed to race, not the Land Rover. Happened to beat it. But these stories continue to come in day after day after day. I get phone calls all the time. My favorite are little old women, little old ladies, right? 80s, 90s. <laughs> God, I love the car now. <laughs> it's never run skin. I can out run the hood now. <laughs> it's crazy. But yeah, uh, then, then I take it in for admissions. Because Phoenix is one of those cities blessed with that organization. Um, and uh, when I take it in, it says it fails because the computer's not ready. So here's a ticket, here's a slip, right? This will get you out of any ticket. This is good for 30 days. Take it out, drive it for a couple hundred miles, and come back and see. Oh, okay, good. Time for a road trip, right? So we leave Phoenix, and we go up to northern Arizona, which is mountainous. We, we don't stay on the highway. We're doing national forest land. We're fish telling around mountains and stuff like that. 
132 miles, I drove that thing without stopping for fuel, and it still had an eighth of a tank over reserve. 632 miles where it wouldn't go 200 miles before. Is that cool? Can I hear a big yeah on it? Hell yeah! All right, okay, yeah. What? You talk about surprise? I'm like, come on, no, there's something wrong with gas gauge. Something wrong with gas gauge. But, you know, I, I put a two-gallon gas can in the back just in case, right? And we just drove that thing and drove it and drove it and drove it and drove it and drove it. And it had more power, more power. You could, couldn't smell the tailpipe. And I said, man, it's a Land Rover, right? So it's got everything unique about it. I wonder does it work on other cars. One little dude, my neighbor's across the street, is F-150. So I go to Mike and I say, Mike, what's up, brother? I say, man, you know what I've been doing, right? Of course, I can't keep my mouth shut. It's forward off me $400 million, by the way. One of the stipulations was I never speak about it. Well, that totally makes the deal. Sorry, I, I can't keep my mouth shut for nothing. <laughs> anyway, so I go to Mike and I say, Mike, what, can, I, can I do your truck there? He said, well, it's my wife's. He said, sure. <laughs> right? <laughs> Little did he know, her, her truck was getting max at 14 miles a gallon, which isn't too bad for a 2004 F-150. Well, it's about average. Went from 14 to 21 miles a gallon. Okay? This is pretty cool. So then I start doing other neighborhood cars. I still ain't telling anybody about this except the people I'm doing the mods for. May the 23rd. That's, okay, so I, I developed it in March of 09, proved it during the month of April on the Land Rover, May started doing other people's cars. May the 23rd, a phone call. Hi, this is Jim Black from General Motors. I heard about what you're doing. We'd like to talk to you. I go, oh shit, who talked? <laughs> and I've got half a dozen different projects on my bench. I still got them in my head today, right? That I'm going to be bringing out. So I don't know what exactly he's talking about. I heard about what you're doing. I'd talk to you. Said, yeah. I said, well, what are we talking about? Right? What, what are we talking about here? It makes perfect sense to me. Tell me what you're interested in. We'll talk. Well, we're going to talk about, we're going to start with about $50 million. I went into instantaneous shock because I was not expecting him to make me a cash offer. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't filed a patent on it yet. Okay? So I started laughing like a hyena. <laughs> Could not control myself, you know? and, and I'm sure the guy thought I was nutting or squirrel poop. <laughs> and a lot of people agree, too. <laughs> and he made some rude noises, started with F and ended with you, and uh, uh, hung up the phone. I'm still laughing. <laughs> okay. Then, then, now I'm laughing for good reason. I just laughed away $50 million. What are you going to Laugh or cry, you know? And, and then I hung up the phone and I said, and I said, think to myself, well, then I guess I'm not supposed to sell it. And when I had that thought, this feeling of rightness came over me. All right, just peace, just yes, that's right. And then when it hit me, that told me all I needed to know. All right, then I'm going to take it to the people. And, and this wave of energy hits me. Yes, that's the right choice. That's the very right choice. It's exactly what you're supposed to do. That settled it. After I cried a little bit, it was $50 million after all. <laughs> I, 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 I decided that that's what I was going to do, and I started to put my mindset into bringing this to the public, to the people on this planet, to help with corporations. Right? They're interested in lining their pockets at our expense, and the more it costs us, the happier they are. Right? The vast majority, I don't know of one that is oriented to help people. That's sad. But it is true. So June the 1st, I make the announcement public. Well, June the 14th, four calls. Their offer was quite a bit more substantial. This time it says, Ron, we heard about what you're doing. Pretty much the same opening. It says, uh, uh, we'd like to fly you up to Detroit. Put you up the top floor of the Hyatt. Get you a rental car for a whole week. Tickets to all the best shows in town. This is what they told me. Tickets to all the best shows in town. All we want is about six hours of your time on Friday. Meet with the board. Well, okay. Um, what are we talking about here? They said, well, we're going to start talking with $400 million. I said, well, okay. Now, by this time, I've had three weeks to condition myself getting ready. You know, this offer's going to come in. 
I said, well, okay, well, we can talk licensing for that. Now, that makes sense to me. They're a manufacturer, right? But they want to they license the technology to put on new cars, because that's what they do, right? Not exactly. I said, well, we can talk licensing for that. And they said, uh, uh, what do you mean licensing, Mr. Hatton? Like, it's a foreign language to him, right? I said, well, you'd be the only new car manufacturer authorized to use the technology in the United States for a limited period of time. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Mr. Hatton, you misunderstand. I say, uh, really? Well, clarify for me. Help me understand. No, we want to buy your technology. We want to buy your technology. I say, okay, all right. What does that mean to all the people who have the groove on their cars right now? Well, Mr. Hatton, uh, those grooves would have to come off. I said, what if they don't want to sell me their throttle bodies? I have a new car. It's 400 million. You can afford it. And, by, and I've got, you know, I'm a member of this family, guys, just like you guys are. And I've talked to a few people. I'm going to teach them because I'm only one person. I can only do so many cars. Right? But you guys, we can do a whole hell of a lot more. Right? So I said, well, what about all the people I promised to teach the technology to? They said, well, Mr. Hatton. Any contract you'd enter into on behalf of the technology would have to be voided. The guy wanted, to make, wanted me to make myself out to be a liar to my customers and my colleagues. That ain't happening. Not in this life. I said, well, let me lay a couple things on the table for you, sir. I said, I don't want your response. I'll let you know when I want you to answer me, but I've got a few things I want to say to you. I said, there are 54 cities in Mexico right now under pollution alert where the air is considered unfit for humans to breathe, and it's 90% due to the pollution created by gasoline engines. You know this. I said, we won't even talk about Pakistan and uh, what, what Mongolia and India and all these other places that are suffering from extreme pollution caused by combustibles and combustion engines. So let's bring it back home. I, I'm starting to get charged now. I said, there are 30 million people out of work in the United States right now today. And that was the published figures back then. Still a lot then, like it is now. 30 million people out of work. I said, at least half of those are men. At least half of those men work on their own cars. I could put them to work. I could teach them this technology and they could apply it in their areas. Help their families, maybe save their houses. I said, what about the major cities in the United States right here, our asthma rates are going up over 200% as a direct result of the pollution coming out of these engines. I can help with that. So but forget about all that. And me, a little background, uh, my dad wasn't around very much when I was a kid. Uh, excuse me. My mom worked second and third shift at a place called Lake and Platt. Manufacturing O-rings. I'll remember it to this day. So many weeks, we ate peanut butter, macaroni and cheese, you know, tuna salad, the cheapest stuff we could get just so we could keep our bellies full. And I would go down the street with weed eaters, you know, not the fast ones right now. You know, they pan help kinds of give you blisters right there. I had a lot of blisters. And I'd go to my neighbor and say, Hey, let me trip in front of your yard for a dollar. And I'd take that money and give it to my mom for gas. A lot of us had been like that. You know, a lot of us grew up in families like that. And I said to him, I said, sir, final statement. I said, what about all the families out there right now that are having to choose between gasoline to get them back and forth to work and groceries to feed their children? What about them? I'm in tears, just like I am right now. I was so frustrated because how many times have they done that to us? He said, Mr. Hatton, he said, for $400 million, you'd have to forget all about them. Uh-huh, yeah. Wrong answer. Way wrong answer. 
I said, then you have to forget about me and my technology. And I hung up the phone. And I set it down on the table. Broke it in six pieces. <laughs> New cell phone. <laughs> and that's what these guys have done. That's, and they continue to do it today. They use money to buy people because people think money is the answer to their problems. It's not. It's community. Working together is the answer. That's why I'm in tears right now on this stage. Because God saw fit to give me a gift. I put it together with my vision. And now, guys, we have something that only works every time. <laughs> Doesn't worry. You don't have to continually tweak it and poke it and stuff like that. And it'll help whatever you're doing. Because it works in harmony with the engine. How much time do I have left? Uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. All right, thank you. All right, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, if I may, how many, how many of you guys have seen some of my videos? Oh, woefully few. I guess I'm not as famous as I thought I was. Oh, yeah, okay, Gadget Man Global. All you really got to do is look up one word, Gadget Man, G-A-D-G-E-T-M-A-N. If you type that into your Google, you'll find me on the front page. If you type, if you type G-A-D-G into YouTube on your own computer, by the time you get to the E, it's already suggesting that you look at the Gadget Man group. Okay, that, that impressed me. When I first, when I was typing in somebody else's computer, I said, holy shit. Wow, I, I, guess, I guess YouTube does recognize me a little bit because my videos have been watched only about 200,000 times. That's not a lot on YouTube. Some videos get a million views, right? Was it uh, Jonathan Bieber as a baby got what, seven million views? What is this, right? All right. So, so Gadget Man Global, I'll go ahead and write this down for you. Real simple. This is, this is my corporate channel. I know you guys probably can't see this. And if you want to learn something about me as a person, I've also got another channel. It's called Ron, Ron the Poet. Okay, and I, I think I do want to do a poem for you guys. It's something I've never done talking before a group like this, right? So that's, that's the YouTube channel. You guys can see that? Gadget Man Global. Oh, that's one word. But just, you can find me. Just look up Gadget Man. All right. And, all right. In an internal combustion engine, piston driven, you have a crankshaft that rolls. The, the piston is connected to the top here, right? It pulls the piston down as the crankshaft rolls. Very simple, right? Top dead center, for five degrees rotation of the crank, there's virtually no vertical movement of the piston, hence no demand for the air, right? Here at 90 degrees, five degrees rotation, the piston moves the fastest, the highest demand for air. Then as the crankshaft continues to roll and drop to the bottom, the demand decreases until it reverses direction and goes back up the other way on the compression strut. We're only going to talk about the intake strut, because that's when the fuel's burning. That's when everything happens with the gauge main groove. After, the, after about 95 degrees rotation, the gauge main groove is almost done. Okay? So the piston speeds up and then slows down. This creates a pressure curve inside the intake manifold that runs something like this. From about 19 inches, to 15 inches, and just like the EPA says, your, your mileage may vary, these numbers will change. So don't hold me to this. But that's about right. Well, the gauge man group, well, this, this creates a pressure wave, right? Well, that's, that's a pull and then a relax of the pull. So it's just like this is a constant wave forever going on in your engine as long as it's running, up and down and up and down. With, with the groove, the way it's designed is the throttle plate sits like this. It sits like this inside of a tube, right? All of the air is moving this direction. Got it? All right. So all of the air is moving this direction. That means whatever air hits this throttle plate right here, in order for it to continue going that way, has to come down the throttle plate. See it? Okay. So that means all of this air underneath there also gets compressed. So you wind up with a very high pressure zone right there at the bottom of the throttle plate, okay? 
as it passes, it's got to shrink down. So this is a huge level of compression to get in that little crack. And then it starts expanding as it goes out. Okay? That's the way it happens now. Now, with the gedge man groove, this, this is what creates late in between those large balls is, is this stuff. Okay? So, what we're going to do is I'm going to put the gedge man groove in there for you. If my tripod falls over, just shoot me. All right, okay. All right, so now here's, here's the throttle body. Now, the gedge man groove is extremely particular. If it's off by more than six degrees, it ceases to provide mileage gains. Okay? It is freaky sensitive. That being said, no matter who you are, the first time you apply a groove, your vehicle will run better. This is consistent. All right? I guess I've done a good job with the training, or you know, guys just understand it. I don't know. All right, so here's the throttle button. Now we're going to put the groove in. It goes in right here. It's kind of semi-circular, and it's a little bit larger. But all we do is machine out of the meat of the throttle, this kind of thing, so that when you've got that high-pressure compressed air here, it's being pushed out, it drops right into the groove. And as it expands, it expands both ways. Liquid air is a fluid. It molds itself in the shape of its container. Okay? So when I cut the groove in there, and it's right past the pressure zone, You've got some air that's being drawn in this way. Has to be drawing air, right? Well, this air speeds up. And as this air speeds up this direction, so does the downward pressure on the groove. So as it expands, it hits this curve right here. Because this intersection point, the radius of this arc, <coughs> this intersection point, and this angle here is all critical to the success of the groove, okay? Hits this here and rolls up here. You guys can see that happening, right? Okay, all right. This is, the, this is the wave that is ejected, but there's more. The true secret, the magic power behind the gauge man groove is in this ball, which is huge. It's right down here because there's also air moving along the throttle passage right down through here, and it gets forced in on this side of the groove, right? Okay, so when these two balls of air hit, they collide and they roll up, just like that, okay? This airstream right here, the faster it moves, the more pressure is put on the groove, causing it to gather more and more air. This is all in the first 90 degrees of the downstroke, guys. Okay? And gal, forgive me. So this ball gathers up more and more air. This airstream creates this ball. This ball winds up being about a thousand times, and I think that's extremely conservative. I think it's vastly higher than that. About a thousand times more dense than the intake airstream itself. Okay? You can see how that would happen. It's only an eighth of an inch deep. Way out of scale. Alright, this stream creates this ball, this pressure. This ball creates this one. So this one to a thousand, one to a thousand, this winds up being a thousand times more dense than that, or one million times as dense as the intake airstream. There is a huge difference between a thousand times something and a million times something. Huge difference. So, the first half of the downstroke, the piston is speeding up, right? But the air is being gathered in the groove. It's not in the intake manifold, so what does it do to the vacuum curve? Causes it to spike. For the first half of the downstroke, it's holding the air, right? Well then, as the piston passes the midpoint, this secondary ball of air, the aerodynamics reverse, because the pressure begins to come off of the groove. This has just been sitting there like a stallion ready to roll. And then when the pressure begins to reduce, this goes off like the primer in a shotgun shell and shoots this ball up into the intake manifold. Okay? So it can continue its travel down the intake to provide the air that is needed to burn the fuel vapor that your vacuum just created. Got it? Yes, sir. Is this about mixing? No. No. I mean, it is. Uh, that's the end result. Uh, but. The way they're doing it now is they're, they're atomizing the fuel with injectors. That's not vapor. It's still a liquid state. Liquid does not mix with vapor. It just doesn't. You've got to have both substances in the same state. So you either have to liquefy your oxygen, which takes thousands of pounds of pressure, and you're not going to get that inside a gasoline engine. Okay? Or you reduce the pressure on the liquid to turn it into a vapor. You see? 
So it only takes a fraction of a second. Anybody who's done any experiments with the pressures will tell you that as soon as the, the pressure hits the right point, it just dissolves. It just turns into vapor state. What happens, and I've got calls from customers telling me that their digital gauges are reading 28 to 29 inches of vacuum. There's no liquid I know of that will withstand 24 inches of vacuum and stay in a liquid state. I don't care what kind of chemicals and garbage is in there, it's still a liquid. You get more than 24 inches of vacuum when that intake valve opens, when the fuel is delivered, and your fuel must be rendered into vapor state. It cannot resist it. It has to. It's a law of physics. So the more vacuum you can get applied to your fuel, the more fuel you have ready to mix with the oxygen. So here the fuel is being, uh, the air is being gathered while the fuel is being delivered. The fuel is being ripped into vapor state. Halfway through it ejects this, boom, there goes your pressure rise to about six to eight inches of vacuum. So what it's doing is it's not reducing the amount of air or increasing the amount of air that goes into it. It actually does reduce it minimally. What it does is it changes the timing with which the air is delivered. Okay? That, that's it. It's that simple. There's only one other aspect to this that matters, and that is the vacuum leaks. Whether they are engineered or accidental, doesn't matter. A vacuum leak is still a vacuum leak. Anything that allows air into the system will allow more air into the system here. Okay? So your vacuum leaks must be tended to. If you have a bad vacuum leak, you'll lose mileage. Let's just vacuum leak. Sir? So, in other words, if we've got an HHO system with this, it would actually hurt us. We should get rid of it? No. Because no, but it'll help your HHO system. That's, okay. that's a vacuum leak, an HHO system. If you put it into the manifold, it is a vacuum leak. But it doesn't have to go into the manifold, does it? Does it? Can it be delivered before the throttle okay, plate? Okay, okay. Yeah. See, that's the way I did with the Land Rover. I was also playing with HHO. All right, and I it went from 200 to uh, I think 275 miles a tank. I put the groove on it. It went to 350. Okay. Turned off the hydrogen because I had to go through emissions. Right. I turned off the hydrogen. The son of a bitch went to 600 miles a tank. Did I turn back on the hydrogen unit? No, no, no. No, because it was half of my fuel consumption. Why was that? Because of the extra oxygen the HHO unit was putting into the system. I couldn't find anything to work with the sensors on the Land Rover. Nothing, because the electronics just used different waveforms. I even bought a brand new computer to go into it. Piggyback, right? So I could take over the fuel delivery because I do not like that the car manufacturers decide how much fuel I should burn. I want that decision. Okay? Yes, people have burned up their engines before by playing with their adjustments in the computers. But that can be avoided if you know what you're doing. Take some time. Research your stuff first. Learn what you need to learn before you act. Look before you leave. Sound familiar? Okay? The people that get out there and make rash decisions, they do something on their car and just go, wow! Okay? Then within a week, they're out there telling people, oh man, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. And everybody's looking for the answers. Right? So they go, okay, great. Then a week later, the car blows up, but they've already told 15,000 people. And 15,000 people out there are now doing the same thing to their engines and telling everybody about it for the first week until their engines blow up. Okay? Don't do that. Please don't do that. Okay? Gage Man Group, I tested it for months and months and months before I actually took it to a more direct level. Okay? Everything about an engine is better. Yes, sir? You know, there's a magic letter written by the director of the EPA. You guys ought to remember this. Write this down. Look for it. Find it. I'm not going to provide it to you. Okay? The director of the EPA wrote a letter explaining why, or explaining the, 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 the terms of this $5,000, $2,500, $15,000, whatever the hell, how much money they want to try to take from this for playing with the emissions control systems. Said, so long as the emissions are not adversely affected, so long as the emissions are not adversely affected, you can do anything you want. You can do anything you want your own car, too. Right? At first, I was, I was so scared that I would have my customers put the vacuum cap on the PCB belt. Okay? 
So it wasn't me, it was they were doing it on their own, but I just helped them. You see? And that's how you get around, you let the customer do it. If you're scared, just let the customer do it. Just say, okay, would you do that for me? As long as they finish it, you help them. Right? Okay? But don't be scared. Don't be scared. Okay? Would you see what happens to the vehicles? That's why the EPA hasn't messed with me. Because I'm showing one out of every three vehicles that I do show 100% reduction in hydrocarbons. 100% reduction in hydrocarbons. 100% complete total elimination of carbon monoxide. Complete and total elimination of oxides of nitrogen and as much as 95% reduction in CO2 emissions. Operating temperatures drop like a rock. I got calls from customers. I got one customer driving a Prius, right? He did an oil change right after I did the modification on his vehicle. was getting 42 miles to the gallon. Again, the estimates lie, okay? His Prius was at 42 miles to the gallon. Afterwards, 66 miles to the gallon. 66. And that's not really impressive to me. It's good, but it's not impressive. I want every vehicle to get double their gas mileage. Everyone. He says, Ron, he said, you know, I put about 10,000 miles on my car. He says, I had that groove in there. He's calling me up with the mileage report. He said, you know, uh, do you think I should change the oil? I said, are you a fool? I said, yeah, you know, three to 5,000 miles is pushing it. He said, no, nah, I don't think so. Nah, no, I'm not going to change it. Come on, man. All right, tell me what's going on. He said, he said, Ron, he said, tell the truth. He said, the oil is still honey brown. He said, there's no sign of use in the engine. Why, 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 how can you produce that? Why, why would such a report come in? Because when you kept the PCV valve, this vacuum is no longer pulling off the higher level hydrocarbons in your oil to make it turn thick and black. Okay? It's also not sucking as much on the, on the fuel that lines your combustion chamber on the walls as the piston's moving up and down before the ignition stroke. Some of that fuel gets into your oil. Well, it's excited. More of it is pulled in the higher the vacuum is on your crankcase. So there's less pollutants going into your oil system. Make sense? Right? Operating temperatures. The most dramatic change in operating temperature I've ever seen was on my RV. It was a 1988 John Deere with a 460. Exhaust manifold temperatures were in the high sixes to the low sevens all the way around the engine. I checked each individual port. I did the modification. High threes to low 400s. 300 degrees off of the exhaust manifold temperature. Routinely documenting 100, 150, 200 degree drops in exhaust manifold temperatures. Why? How can this be true? Because the fuel is burning inside the engine and not inside the exhaust manifold. Y you see? Yes. All right. He says I've got five words left. No, is that five minutes? <laughs> okay. I, I don't mind because I don't wear a watch. So I can't keep them. I can't keep them. I keep breaking them. A lot of things. All right. So he, he says five minutes. So let's, let's say this. Who's got questions? Wow, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you. Stand up. Stand up. Let everybody hear. You're pointing to the uh, throttle, uh, and you said the vacuum. Uh, oh, no, it's pointing to the vacuum curve. Uh, no, I mean, uh, the vacuum is actually, uh, on which side is, is there uh, more vacuum? or? This, this is the low pressure zone on the throttle plane. This is the high pressure zone. Okay? On the intake side or on the... Uh, the air is going this way. This is the engine side. On the engine side. Yeah, this is the air filter side. So where's the more pressure? Or more the back more of the plane? Huh? More pressure is before the plane. Less more pressure, pressure out of the plane. Yeah, the vacuum is on this side. Yeah. So the low pressure zone is on the engine side. Yes. Okay? All right, there's somebody over here. Yes? Well, would you, what's the reference on that ladder? Should we ever need to... Look it up, and I want you to send me a copy of it. I want all of you to send me copies of it. Show me you know how to do your research. Okay? I, I kid you not. Listen, one of the biggest headaches I have is I put up this information because it's real technical, but there's a lot of dynamics, and I understand that it's, it's not easy to understand sometimes because you've got to put together a lot of things. But I put all the information out there on the Internet. Anybody that wants to can look at what I've built and build their own if they want to. It's better to get my bits. All right? But if you don't do your research and you call me, I'm going to ask you, look, is it on the forum? Oh, I don't know. I haven't been there. Did you look at my videos? Oh, you have videos? No. Okay, well, look, go look. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yes, I don't mean to be unkind. You understand? Yes, sir.
Yeah. All right, he said that a Mark, uh, seven, uh, what year is it? 74. A 74 Mark IV Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, and I lived up the hood and they did the voice come down to the top. Right. The point that I want to make is it's not complete yet because Aaron and I are trying to do what we're trying to do with the electrical system. Uh -huh. That's only part of the field. Uh -huh. But what I, the point I want to make is when I switched over to hydrogen, it jumped up, its efficiency is about five times more. Yep. And I got it on film that the first time I did it with a homemade unit, okay, mm -hmm. I had to hold my foot on the, on the uh, brake going out the driveway in idle. Mm -hmm. And then she's got it, she yep. videotaped me going down the street 10 miles an hour yep. in idle. No, not touching uh, I, I, The same thing happens with the group. This thing burns out the carbon. Uh -huh. It keeps getting stronger right. and stronger. And mm -hmm. it's got a 460 motor and weighed right. three and a half tons. And I laid rubber leaving the car. Yeah, so yeah. And then when your fuel burns where it's supposed to, amazing things happen to your engine. <laughs> yeah, there's somebody back there. We're out of time. One more question, please. Yeah, stand up. Does it matter if it's fuel injected? Does it matter? Does it have a throttle plate? That is the only question that matters. Not even what kind of fuel it burns. If it has a throttle plate, the gauge man group will help it. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, now, now guys, I'm, I'm afraid I'm out of time. All right, I, I'll be available. I'm going to be getting out of these duds. I like to dress up day, but i got to go to work. All right? So if you want, I'll be outside here doing modifications. Please get a hold of me. And get my, I, I'm Gadget Man, Ron Hatton. You can reach me, Gadget Man and Gadget Man Groove, anytime you want. God bless y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you.